the meaning of free energy. Just because you've generated this energy doesn't mean you're going to be able to use it to do work. Free energy, Gibbs free energy, Delta G, that's a measure of the maximum amount of work that you will be able to do with a reaction. And the energy changes, we now know because of the formula that we're using, the delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. The energy changes are in two parts, and we can talk about the fact that this is useful and can be used to do work, and this is unusable. It's just going to be loss. And in order to think about that, then what you would say was the that delta H is delta G plus T delta S. That would be another way of writing it, in which then you would say, okay, here's all the energy that was released, here's the Gibbs free energy I can use to do work, and this is the part lost to entropy. Here in 14, what we're trying to talk about is a particular situation. Let's look at this temperature. 273 Kelvin, well, that's zero Celsius. When ice melts or water freezes. You can think of this point as being where you, you're in between, right? So maybe this is a very cold glass of water with ice in it. If you raise the temperature, you end up expecting the ice to melt. If you lower the temperature, you expect the water to turn into ice. The way they've written this, they say non-spontaneous. They're considering this to be a spontaneous when the temperature is higher, so they must be analyzing ice melting in order for us to be understanding what this picture was about. Because they're saying when the temperature is high, this thing is a spontaneous reaction, and we know that that is what happens when the temperature is higher than zero degrees Celsius is ice will melt. And they're making a very interesting point here by saying that the reaction itself has a delta H that does not vary. Now, this is not strictly true, but as long as you're close to this temperature, delta H could be considered a constant. And so they've just drawn it as delta H is a constant. And then what they've drawn here is something that has a slope. It's T delta S. So T is the X value, and it is the variable, and the delta S could be considered to be a slope of the line. So T delta S then has this, and where they cross is where delta G is zero. That would mean that delta H is just exactly T delta S at that point. So this is telling us a little bit more about how we should be viewing this. We're using T as the variable then. It's displayed on the x-axis. And we can say that this is energy versus temperature. And delta S is the slope of one of the lines. And delta H is just straight across. So if we want the system to be an equilibrium where we are neither going towards having more water or having more ice, delta G is zero. When that is true, then we know not only that delta G is zero, but that delta H is exactly equal to T delta S. We're used to just thinking of this as being, oh, this is the temperature at which ice melts, but it's actually a crossover temperature between whether or not the reaction will be spontaneous or not. Oh, well, delta H is a set number and T delta S is going to be the part that actually changes because T is the thing that we can control. It's the independent variable. And then there would be certain cases where we could make a reaction spontaneous by changing the temperature. If I draw a new graph, and on this graph, on the x-axis, I'm going to put delta H. On the y-axis, I will put delta S. Well, the delta G is made out of these two things, right? Let's just talk about whether delta H is positive or negative, right? Here I have that delta H is positive. So same thing is true here, delta H is positive. 
on this side, delta H is negative. That's just using the quadrants, right? But I also can do it this way, talking about delta S. So delta S is positive up here and up here. Delta S is negative here and here. T, because it's in Kelvin, can only be a positive number. So it's always positive. So then when I start thinking about delta G being a combination of delta H minus T delta S, I can see that if I was to do this one, delta H being negative, delta S is positive, but here's a negative sign here. That would always end up with a negative number. This will result with delta G always being negative and Everything is spontaneous here. I always get delta G is negative, and it does not matter what the temperature is. Let's look at this one then. Down in this quadrant, delta H is positive. Hmm. Delta S is negative, but I'm multiplying it by a negative, so it's also positive. So delta G is always going to be positive here. And that means this is never spontaneous. These two, I'm going to have some control over it. Spontaneous, never spontaneous, but there's going to be some sort of a crossover temperature. So this one, there exists, that's from math, a crossover temperature. Same thing down here, there exists a crossover temperature. So which way is it going? Let's look at this one first. Delta H is positive. Delta S is positive, but here's a negative sign right? I'm looking for when delta G will finally become a negative number so that I can say that it is spontaneous. Well, that will happen if I make the temperature high enough. So in this quadrant, I want T to be very high, and then I will be able to make this a spontaneous reaction. Let's talk about a different reaction now over in this quadrant. If delta H is negative, well, that's good. I'm thinking I'm going to have a delta G that would be negative then, but I have to look at the other part. Delta S is negative. The negative signs will cancel, and this contribution will be positive. If it becomes too positive, it's going to stop this from being negative. So this is, a, is the case where I want the temperature to be really low then I will be able to have a crossover temperature. Low temperatures are what is favored here, and high temperatures are what's going to drive a reaction to become spontaneous in, these, in this case.